pleasure uh, speaking with you. I mean, it's crazy to think I first watched your fights at UFC 1 more than uh, 25 years ago. Could you have ever imagined you'd still be a part of fighting so many years later, now running a Valor Bare Knuckle? When you're, when you're focused on, you know, your life and the direction of your life, uh, not, a lot of hope, not a lot goes through your mind but what you're actually doing. My thought was just to, you know, the opportunities that I had was to, you know, I enjoyed it, I loved it, um, it was something that I wanted to do, and uh, so I just trained hard and worked hard. And, you know, I obviously, I, I obviously uh, played hard too, so, but it was, it was, it was a fun journey, uh, but you really don't look ahead to see where you're going to end up. What was the driving force for the promotion to kind of bring back those old days of gladiators? No, I think it it really brings back more of the, a feeling of the enjoyment. Um, I don't get the same kind of feeling as actually going in there and competing, but uh, there's a certain satisfaction to know that I'm actually uh, giving other fighters the experience that I had, that, that, that realness of fighting, uh, the purity of fighting, and, and being able to have other guys experience that, that's exciting to me. What, what would you say to those that kind of look at your latest endeavor as more of a spectacle than a sport? Because, I mean, they made a whole deal when uh, UFC was first coming, even though they had gloves on. So what would you say to this now without the gloves? Well, I would say the ones that are saying that are one, either inexperienced or two, uh, afraid. And when I say afraid, I mean you know, people that maybe like boxing or, or maybe like the MMA and don't want to see another uh, event come in there and actually um, take over or do better. Um, but anybody that just watched Darren Uncle and is able to experience it, um, you know, you can really tell that the fighting is fast. Uh, and that it's um, it's only for guys that are tough, guys that have the mental stability to be able to go in there and set their minds to, to go in and actually get, get something done. Um, so for me, I try not to let that kind of noise affect the direction that I know the Valor team wants to go because I think there are some out there that have a legitimate understanding uh, of of this being maybe not what they want to see because I, I do believe that some of the events out there are, are just street fights you know I mean it's it's exciting to watch I mean you know, obviously street fights you watch it happen it goes viral on social media so people watch like a car accident right you don't mm -hmm. want it to happen but when it does everybody watches um, but I, I believe that's what you know some of these other fight rooms are because uh, there's no cleanliness to it, like, you know, guys, guys holding each other and punching each other in the head while they're, they're holding each other's head, and, you know, there's some of that stuff that we want to clean up and, uh, and, and make it more of a, an event uh, that you can watch like you would if you were boxing or if it was MMA, um, that it has some um, cleanliness to it where you know what you're watching and it's not just two guys you know, holding on to one another, trying to rabbit punch your headbutt or, or do whatever you're doing to somebody. So uh, that's why when we brought in Valor, we said, you know, we wanted to have the, the actual boxing rules, but we just want to take the gloves off mm -hmm. so that people can see some professionalism. Now, during the early days of MMA, especially UFC, Pride, and all that, Fighters basically were learning skills on the fly, uh, really, while fighting. So, if, I mean, there's nowhere to train. So, do you ever imagine how much better even your Hall of Fame career would have been with all these advancements in training, the plethora of coaches out there, really, today? Yeah, the sky is the limit. I mean, I did, I did a lot of the stuff I did, which put me in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, blind, just blind, because there was no understanding and a lot of the training stuff that we did uh, people would look at it and go man why did you that's crazy man why did you guys train like that it's just because we didn't know I mean I felt like at the time because there was no there was no real um, book that you could read to tell you how to fight you know holds hard um, so basically we just did it and we went into the gyms and, and we, I would sit there 
and have a guy come in every every minute, a fresh guy every minute, and and we would do battle. And I'd bring guys from out of town, Olympic wrestlers, uh, you know, boxers, professional boxers, kickboxers, and I would bring them. I would invite them to my gym, and I would have them, you know, come after me, and I would take them down, or you know, uh, box with them, do whatever, so that I. Uh, put myself in a situation where I could get in shape and mentally be ready to go in and fight in four, four times in one night, basically like a street fight. So uh, w- there was a lot of feeling out process. And you know, I was the very first um, organized MMA or no rules barred team. So, yeah, with um, Lions it Den, was absolutely. A journey. It was a journey. Yeah, Lions Den really seemed to be revolutionary uh, when when this whole thing started out. Yeah, and, and again, we weren't, um, you know, we weren't doing everything right with the training. But like I said, there was no book. But I will say this: that my guys succeeded because uh, I made them fight in the gym, and I wanted to go through worse than what they would go through in the ring in the gym, so that when they stepped in front of the crowd, they had nothing to fear because they had already gone through the worst. Yeah, I, I mean, I I know you've talked about it in the past before. There, there is so many stories about basically the audition process to get, get into Lions Den. People said it was almost worse than like going into uh, the military. So, is it is that really what was kind of needed to really show that these guys were w- willing to work hard and take it to that next level? Yeah, one of the things that I wanted to weed out was I didn't want to have to train somebody for a year. And then they walk away um, because they just didn't want to do it. So I felt like if I could put them through a one-day training, which was probably about an eight-hour um, training thing, it was brutal, um, that if they were able to make it through that day, then, then I had somebody that I knew wanted to do it, and they weren't going to walk away halfway through the training. And so it was a system that really worked because I didn't have uh, very many people actually walk away. I think I had two um, out of all of the guys that passed the Lions then that literally um, just walked away. But every one of those guys that did walk away were already successful. Does it kind of irritate you when, I mean, so many fighters of today kind of claim that superiority to those that fought years ago, but, I mean, you guys t- have to have so much, so much resolve. I mean, they fight one time, whatever, every six months, a year. You guys had more than a few fights in one night. Yeah, I mean, there was three to four fights in one night. Um, I remember in in a month that I had fought, um, I think it was six, so it was like eight times in one month Jeez. because I had done a tournament over in Japan and then I fought twice in the UFC within a month period. Um, so... It, it, it really was, you know, the, the Wild Wild West because there was really no sanctioning body to keep guys from just going from tournament to tournament. I remember hearing stories about um, some guys that would drive across the, the uh, United States and they would stop in different places that had fights along the way and they would just fight. And uh, so it was, like I said, it was something that when I mean, you watch movies, those are kind of things that you see in the movies. Uh, but it, but it was real. People did it, and, and I did it. I was one of those guys that literally would walk out behind the bar. And the bar would close down, and you'd find the toughest guy in the bar, and guys would start betting on the fight behind the bar. But was it one of those two, though? I mean, after th- those kind of f- fights behind the bar, that you guys kind of hugged it out. I mean, it was kind of like one of those where it's water under the bridge after the fight. Well, not necessarily, because a lot of times we would go into some uncharted territory. For instance, you know, one of the things that I did, I got woke up at 2 in the morning. One of my buddies wanted to bring me down because this guy had heard I'd won this tough man. And that they had this, it was, a, it was kind of a biker bar. And that they thought that uh, they wanted to fight me. And they were going to put up 500 bucks. And so he came and got me. And so I remember going out there and walking into this circle of cars with these lights lit up behind this bar that was already closed. <laughs> um, and I walked out, fought the guy, knocked him out. Um, but we grabbed that money and left because uh, it wasn't a comfortable atmosphere when you're walking into someone else's territory and it's their fighter. 
and he, he basically knocked him out, and you're going to stand around and party with him. I don't think the night's going to end very well. <laughs> so we just jumped in the truck and left after we were done. <laughs> What, what, what about on a professional level? Ha, has kind of time healed old wounds? I mean, like the bad blood, maybe with the Gracies, uh, Tito Ortiz, any of that? No, I've actually got to make uh, uh, an effort to go out and uh, bury the hatchet um, with myself, Tito, Dana White, um, a lot of guys that I, you know, we had a, a disagreements or arguments or, or, or frustration towards one another. Um, the only one that uh, has uh, I don't know, I guess just kind of just rubs me wrong uh, and I can't seem to um, understand him and that's Hoist because yeah. the last fight that we had, he knew he knew me in the, in the going low. There was a couple other things in our fights that they had done to, to you know, lean things towards their way. Um, but he would never, he would never accept that you know, he had done something wrong. Um, and to me, that just bothers me because as a fighter, you know, uh, and the pride and, and the humility that you had uh, towards another fighter, that, you know, what's right is right. And, and you, you've got to go, hey, listen, yeah, it was a mistake, you know, sorry about that. Uh, even at that, when the fight happened, and even the press conference, he admitted to doing it um, by saying, well, that's the way we used to fight, you know, and it just it, it just rubbed me wrong. I'm thinking, yeah, but we're not fighting that way anymore. If we were, I would not have clinched. I would not have been there because I know the rules are different. Um, unfortunately, um, he wouldn't fight me again. I asked for that. Um, mm -hmm. Scott Coker did not uh, want to put the fight back together again. I don't know why because numbers, each time I fought, went through the roof. A record-setting numbers. Um, so I'm not sure why that did not happen right after that again, but um, it, it, like I said, it bothers me. It's one that bothers me today still, uh, because I know me, if I hit somebody, and I've done it, I proved it when I fought Royce in the very, very first fight we fought, where the referee didn't know that um, that uh, I had tapped, and he literally asked me again, because he was going to have the fight keep going, and I looked at him and said, no, nah, I tapped, which I didn't want to, I wanted to keep fighting, it just was it was one of those things where I, I had been unfamiliar with the game and it was something I hadn't experienced before. So I was really frustrated at myself and wanted to go at him again. But I knew that I tapped. And so I, I, I admitted it when he said, you know, his point. No, no, you tapped, you tapped. Uh, and so I had to admit it uh, right there on, on, the, on TV, pay-per-view in front of everyone. But when it came to him and he hits me in the groin, uh, he was comfortably taking the win. To me, that just doesn't sell well. Wow. People who haven't really competed like at that highest level, whether as a fighter or another sport, I, I got to imagine you can't just turn off that mindset. So how could you ever really step away, even when like people are telling you you're past your prime or not? It's it's kind of like that that inner like desire to keep going. I think that people, when they're saying that, they don't understand why I'm doing it. Um, I think it hurts some people to see someone like me, who they followed over the years, not be as good as I used to be. And it hurts to see some of them that, that, that respect me or love me. It hurts, hurts them to see me lose. But what they don't understand is it's that it's something that I enjoy doing. And that I have fought all of this way, earned my reputation, earned my opportunities to be where I was at, and that if I want to go out and fight for a half million dollars or a million dollars, uh, even though I'm out of my prime, shouldn't I have that right to fight as long as I want to fight, just as long as I'm able to go out and compete? Because it really is an opportunity for me to keep doing what I really gets me my blood going and gets me excited, even though I'm not as good as I used to be at that time. It really made me happy. It was something I enjoyed, the process, all of it. And to have someone tell me, you guys, you probably shouldn't do it anymore. They don't know what it's like to be there and have something that you truly love be taken away from you. You, sh you need to walk away when you know that you've had your fill and you don't want to do it anymore. But as long as you have the desire, who's to tell you not to keep going? Exactly. I don't understand that process. I mean, people look at it from a completely different angle because they're not in there actually fighting. It's like when people get forced into retirement 
I mean, it hurts them. It's frustrating to them because it's the same thing of you being, even though you can still do the job, but because you're older, um, for whatever reason, people put an, a, a, you know, retirement or making people walk away. They always seem to want to put an age on it. And I think age is not something that you look at. I think you look at the actual person themselves. And if they're still capable of doing the job, then why not let them do the job uh, as long as they want to do it? I see fire department, police department, um, all these different um, government jobs that have a, a, a time, time frame on it. And as soon as you hit that time frame, whether you're still one of the best, uh, it doesn't matter. They're going to let you go because they just won't bring you past the time frame. And it doesn't make sense because everybody's different. All of us are different. Some people um, seem to age well. Mm-hmm. And so it's not fair for them to make push you out when you're still capable of doing the job. You not, may not be the best at it, but you're still capable of doing it. Yeah, it kind of goes back to one of my favorite quotes of a movie uh, with Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. But Yes. So kind of like everybody's in a, in a whirlwind with this pandemic. How, how has it affected you and uh, the promotion and how you're able to move on to the next event? Yeah, it's tough because um, it just seems like you don't know which way the wind's blowing. Uh, unfortunately, for the people of the United States, we're stuck in between a political war. And it seems like all these different situations that we're using as ammo uh, to hurt another person. Um, and and that's, uh, that's, not, that's not right. All these things that are happening are all stuff that are being... Um, shoved down people's throats and used as political, um, um, I guess, uh, poison uh, to, to hurt somebody or to try to push uh, someone in power out or people's in power out. Um, so for us, uh, sitting around and having to watch the news and see how these people talk to one another and the anger they have towards each other or just viewing the future generation of uh, young kids on how you're supposed to act towards one another and it's not a good thing it's really not um there's no respect paid towards anybody uh you know it's almost the same thing as you put an age on something instead of looking at a purpose for who they are as a person you're looking at it because they're a democrat or a republican and if they're one or the other you hate them um and you don't even know um and that's what we're in the middle of with, with all these things that are happening is that no one seems to want to lift their, their hand up and actually get the job done. I had a, uh, my daughter had a, had a, a friend of hers. Uh, her father passed away um, two days ago. Oh, wow. And they basically went in, he had, he went in the, the he had called in the, the hospital, uh, he had told him that he had these different symptoms. person on the phone said, hey, you know, uh, stay home. Um, you got, you got, uh, the virus, the coronavirus. Uh, so he stays home. Um, and he seems to be getting better, right? He doesn't seem anything's wrong with him. And then, uh, within two months, uh, he goes back in and they're testing him for corona. Uh, they can't find anything. And then, so his wife goes home to get some clothes to, to, uh, bring to the hospital. She's driving back. She just leaves, gets closed, comes back. They pick up the phone and tell her she needs to get back there quick. She gets there. The guy's organs failed and he dies. But he dies of leukemia. This is what I'm talking about. It's like, this is what we're stuck in, right? We're stuck in, in information that is not clear to us as people. What are we dealing with? How are we dealing with it as a nation? Uh, and so there's so much conflict going on that nobody's dealing with the American people. They're fighting amongst each other and they're not, they're really not feeding us true information because every single person that uh, is on TV, whether it's Democrat or Republican, all have an agenda that they're trying to push down our throats. So they don't care whether they're lying um, or they're manipulating situations, but we're not getting the truth. And so we're all living in this world now in this conflict. And we're all confused. 
Yeah, and it's one of those that it's almost like, pinch me, I want to wake up. Is This a whole thing seems surreal. You got friends, belittling friends. I mean, everybody's saying the left, everybody's saying the right, kind of like you're saying. I mean, you have no way of knowing wh which side is correct because you never know the false narrative. And if you're watching one station, which this is something that I warn people on, if you're watching one station that's feeding the news, whether it's Democrat or Republican, you're being brainwashed so that you won't believe anything else anybody else is saying. And then your mind is so, so messed up that you're walking away from, after watching it for an hour. You're walking away angry at whatever side they're going against. You're walking away angry. Even though you haven't heard their side yet. And, and that's what we're teaching our young generation. That's what we're teaching our kids is to hate without even knowing or even getting information about who you're hating. Maybe they need to step inside the octagon. Well, I'll tell you, that to me has always been, um, even when we were in group home, it's always been the purest way of getting respect uh, for each other is two guys get angry at one another. They want to fight. We put them in the pit, which was a dugout pool, and you would go at it until both of you had had enough. Most of the time, uh, you know, they get very tired within one or two minutes, and then they're hugging one another. After they're punching each other, they finally hug each other, and they're good. So to me, it's always been the, the purest uh, in, in when you're truly mad at somebody for something, and you, and you want to get even. You just throw it in the pit, and you go at it, and afterwards they hug it out. I mean, obviously, that's a little extreme when you're talking about adults and grown-ups. Yeah. Uh, that's just not, not possible, but... But, but, but if you look at what that is, that's coming together and dealing with it. That's the actual message, is that you face off with each other and you talk about it without being angry and calling each other names. You figure out what the other person wants and you figure, the other person figures out what the other person wants and you try to meet in the middle. Yeah. Well, it, it always goes back to that saying, walking uh, somebody else's <laughs> shoes before kind of taking the next leaf. Exactly. Don't always think that just because you see something um, a certain way that somebody else does, and that they're idiots if they don't see it the same way. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. So tell me, what what's going on with uh, the possibility the next event? Is there anything on the books? Are we going to find anything in South Florida? Well, right now we're um, we got some some real good things happening. So we're right now in the process of. Uh, putting those pieces together. We, our goal was to do something in September or August. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if we'll be able to do a pay-per-view then, but what I do know is that we would definitely be doing something within those months um, that will be battle-related so that people will be able to watch. Um, and we got, like I said, we got some interesting partners uh, that are, are building the valid team as we speak and building our network, social media, all those things that will help us um, when this this uh, pandemic uh, hopefully um, lets go of its stranglehold and we'll be able to start uh, moving forward again. Uh, we'll be ready to do that. And right now we've got to deal with the uh, restrictions and all that, so we're we're building it uh, so that we don't. Even if the even if the thing goes on for another year, we're still able to reach the people and be able to put on events uh, in a creative way. So uh, that's what we're doing now. Um, we're we're dealing with the pandemic. We're we're the team is building certain platforms for us to be able to start doing stuff. Uh, either set October, September, October, maybe earliest August that we might have something out there, but not, not a full-blown uh, fighting event, but it will be something that people will be able to watch uh, that will be creative and fun. So just stay tuned, man. We're, we're working uh, behind the scenes. We're building something I think is going to be special. Um, but at the same time, too, I'm also, if you're in, uh, a fan of wrestling and a fan of mine, mm -hmm. I am July 18th. I'm going to be um, Impact Wrestling in Nashville. It will be on... Uh, I believe it's um, a pay-per-view, but it'll also be Access TV at, I believe, uh, it was at 5 o'clock my time, uh, 8 o'clock Eastern time. So um, 
yeah, so if you want to check that out, it's Impact Wrestling. So that's what I'm doing. Going for the tag team titles with myself and Sammy Callahan against the North. That should be real fun. I got some issues with those guys that I need to uh, take out on them. Um, but uh, yeah, so got that stuff going. Got a, a book that's coming that's out. Uh, it's an interesting read. So yeah, so a lot of interesting stuff. I'm very excited that I'm able to stay this busy while this pandemic's going. Yeah, it, it it almost makes you uh, more more focused, I guess. Well, it definitely doesn't allow you to um, get unfocused because you got a lot of time that there's really nowhere to go or nothing to do. So I focus on the stuff that I know that I can make a difference and looking really looking looking forward to really getting out there and getting this impact uh, wrestling going because I love the biggest one of fans, uh, whether it's on TV or in, a, in the stadium. Uh, but at the same time, I also um, love fighting, and I love the bare knuckle. I've always have. I always thought that was the purest form of fighting. So being able to have other fighters follow their dreams, man, that's fun for me. What, what, what do you think of the idea of fighting without fans in the crowd? Is, is that something that you'd entertain, or you, you'll wait till they're allowed back? Yeah, I mean, I think right now it's the... Our thought is to build a platform to move forward with the way things are. Um, there is no crowds. Um, it's basically social media, mm-hmm. and TV, and pay-per-view. So as we move forward, um, that's what we're doing. Because we, when, the, when this thing does let go, as you come back in, um, our platform that we build will be um, friendly to both our social media uh, and also live crowds. So we're, we're excited about the future. Awesome. And uh, just kind of wrapping it up, I mean, what what would you say to somebody who wants to be a fighter, namely a part of Valor? I mean, what luxury should they plan to kind of give up if they're going to try and be a part of it? Well, first thing I would say is that, you know, you got to have a plan B. Um, whenever you go into it, whether it's any sporting event or anything that, it, it, that it's physical, um, that there's injuries, there's definitely a high volume of injuries, uh, you need to have a plan B because I don't care if you're the greatest fighter in the world. I've seen a lot of guys and I've trained guys that were really, really good that had an injury and that injury basically took away their opportunity to be the greatest. Uh, and so to have a plan B in case something happens to where you don't actually reach that place that you need to be, even though in your mind you know you're good enough to. Um, it's a sad sight to see somebody that puts all their eggs in one basket, and the next thing you know, there's no there's there's no other way for them to go because they put everything into it. So, I say, you know, make sure that the, you you have an out that if something does come up and something happens, that you have something to fall back on, whatever it be, whether it's a fireman or a teacher or whatever it is that you choose to do. Uh, just have that plan B because it's an uncomfortable feeling to know that if something happens to you, uh, that you can't support your family. Awesome. Well, hey, I really, really appreciate your time. Um, it's been been great talking to you. I would love to uh, maybe uh, get together a- another time and talk again. Uh, look forward to uh, the future of all, all your events and all your other endeavors. Well, I appreciate that. And one last thing is a uh, shout out to everyone out there um, that's listening. I appreciate you guys listening. And one of the things I always like to tell people um, is that um, every single day when you wake up, man, you always try to be better. Be better than you were yesterday. God bless. Thank you. 